Hello and welcome to the World Sports Blockchain Summit. My name is Anya and I will be your host today. The World Sports Blockchain Summit is the largest live online event for crypto investors, athletes and sports enthusiasts. We have prepared a top lineup of speakers today with some joining us live in studio while others dialing in remotely with their contribution. While our focus will be on sports industry and blockchain, our speakers come from different backgrounds and will give us a comprehensive insight into what future will bring to this exciting crypto world we live in. The World Sports Blockchain Summit is hosted by Sportico, the world's first decentralized sports investment ecosystem. At Sportico, we believe that every promising athlete deserves the opportunity to pursue their professional career and every small investor should be able to back an athlete they believe in. Unfortunately, professional sports today has a high entry barrier, both for athletes and small investors, especially up-and-coming athletes at the outset of their professional careers face a lot of issues related to funding their training and participation in events across the globe. Also, many sports clubs and other sports organizations deal with severe financial and liquidity issues. Sportico is about to change this. Sportico will remove these barriers by deploying a blockchain-based crowdfunding platform serving athletes, clubs and other sports organizations in raising the funds required to achieve athletic success and enable a wider community to invest in sport. By disrupting the existing model for financing participants in sports, Sportico will open a new chapter in the sports industry democratizing the sports investments. The Sportico project is supported by numerous luminaries and celebrities, both from the sports industry as well as from the blockchain and business world, with the latest ambassador, Louis Figo, joining our ranks this week. You'll be able to listen to some of the uh, most uh, celebrities and other renewed names supporting Sportico later on, as well we have several of our advisors among the speakers on the summit. But let's shift and focus back on today's happening. Our speakers today have a wide array of experience from the world of sports, finance, business and blockchain. They build their knowledge throughout the years and decades of bringing su successful new products and ideas to the market. Before and in the next couple of hours, they will share some of the knowledge, of course, with us, tuning in to our live stream. And before we dig in into the nuances of how to integrate blockchain technology in the business world and the sports industry, let's take a step back and uh, those who follow the summit from the sporting part but are not very well versed in the details of how the blockchain technology actually works. So explaining a little bit. Joining me here right now in the studio is Robby Schwartner. Yeah? Hello. <laughs> or better said, Crypto Robby, a name well known to everyone who follows Sportico and the blockchain world in general. He's one of the best known cryptocurrency speakers in the world and therefore a regular future and of course figure on stage at the biggest conferences in the world. So Robbie will also join us again, again uh, later on with a more in-depth lecture on how to leverage these new technologies to give added value to the ecosystem and the community. But first, let's dig into the short beginner's lecture answering a very relevant question actually. What is blockchain and the blockchain everybody's talking about? What is it? <laughs> what is it? That's a big question, Anja. Isn't Thank it? you very much for the introduction. <laughs> uh, blockchain is a very difficult uh, word. Even the word blockchain. I mean, this word is already hard to pronounce. Yeah, It okay. starts from the word. 
when we uh, when we talk about blockchain, we compete with other buzzwords like artificial intelligence, mm. like virtual reality. Blockchain is very much linked to Bitcoin, so pff, that's where we start. Um, blockchain, to put it very simple, it's a decentralized database. Okay, the okay. IT guys they now open their eyes, are very happy about it, <laughs> but in general, blockchain is indeed a so-called distributed ledger technology, DLT, how mm -hmm. it's called. Hmm. Good, still, we don't know more. Uh, blockchain is, um, was uh, founded um, in the 19, 19, uh, 2008 mm -hmm. in a scientific paper. It was written by Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, this person or group of person had the idea that we don't want to centralized data, like the internet. Internet is a centralized system. You have servers where you mm. store the data. Mm. Okay. The problem with these servers is they can be hacked. We heard of Facebook, the yeah. data was stolen, and we know of banks, some, sometimes uh, things are stolen from there, data are stolen, hacked by hackers. With blockchain, the clever idea is you just cut out the server. You just take it away. Okay. So, which means no service anymore. Hmm. But the idea is to give everyone the complete set of data. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. So everyone, like the internet, many, many users, millions of users, will receive all the data. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's interesting. So it's not as sensible, it's more powerful? Um, the idea is to give everyone everything. Mm -hmm. So if one is hacked, yeah, if like I'm hacked with my database, the other users, and in the beginning it's hard, you know, if you have a few users, then it's difficult. Mm -hmm. But if you have millions of users, then you can check uh, the data. And then you see, mm -hmm. okay, this rubbish database is maybe hacked, and the others are still fine. So you continue with the majority. And you see now here, it's kind of democratic principle mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in, inside this blockchain, which means the majority has the rule, and you continue with the, the data which are not disrupted. But still, that's very hard to explain, I guess. Um, what, what Satoshi Nakamoto had in mind in, in, this, in this very uh, first scientific paper when he described Bitcoin was, we want to cut out the middleman. Uh, I don't know, they, they, they didn't think about the middle person, middle <laughs> woman, <laughs> so they said middle man, okay. Um, the idea is it's a peer-to-peer -peer technology. Hmm. Good, what does it mean? If, um, for instance, if I transfer you money, mm -hmm. hmm, how would that work? I take out my phone and I could take out my phone. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's take out. So I, I would go to my app, yes, mm -hmm. and I would like write 100 to Anya. So I would know, know your account number and maybe you would take out your phone if you have one. If I and had one. If yeah, <laughs> okay. okay. I, I assume you have one. Mm -hmm. So let's assume you have one. There would show up 100. Okay. Okay. What I do is, I have here 100 to Anya, and you have it later on 100 more, let's take euro, 100 mm -hmm. euro, and I have 100 less. But what happens in the background? Mm -hmm. In the background it happens like I write 100, it goes to my bank, and the bank says, okay, this is Robbie Schwertner, he has 100 euro on his account, and he is allowed to transfer it. Good. Next it goes to your bank, mm -hmm. and the bank says, yeah, right, this is Anya's account, and it's possible to transfer. And then it goes to your mobile phone. Hmm, good. So you have two units of trust in between, mm -hmm. which means you need a bank and controls. They must check, they must save the data, they must update the data. And provision. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what blockchain does is we could also agree to something else. We could, we could agree um, we take another system. Let's call it WhatsApp. I write 100 here and you get it directly. Yeah. So, okay, I send you, Anya gets plus 100, okay. Um, we know each other, so we could deal that mm -hmm. with that. But the charm and the beauty of blockchain technology is that even also you don't know a person, you could transfer data and mm -hmm. you can transfer funds, which means I write 100 here and mm -hmm. we we, we agree that we use a new WhatsApp, and this WhatsApp is called blockchain technology. So we agree all these nodes that we use this to transfer, for instance, money. 
Mm -hmm. And that would mean I transfer 100 here and directly to you via this WhatsApp or this SMS or Telegram, you can call it like you want, directly to you. What's the result? You don't need any banks. Yeah. They are gone. And that's what's called cutting out the middleman. That's cutting out this... The provision, yeah. The, exactly. And exactly. the time, of course. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's for money. So the big change between internet and blockchain is internet was the, um, the age where we had access to information. So when I remember, you know, when I was at the end of my studies, I was Googling in the, in the mid-90s the first time. It was so wonderful. I could access the world through the computer. I could Google mm. and find every word I wanted to. And I had access to this big ecosphere of uh, information. Mm. So the internet is the, a, a network of information. With blockchain, that's the, as I, and that's why I'm so in love with this technology. <laughs> I yes. can see that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'm too much in love. Maybe I just <laughs> have these pink glasses. I just see the advantages and wonders and beauties. So I, I, um, blockchain has the ability to transfer funds, mm -hmm. value. So internet, transfer of information. Uh -huh. Blockchain, transfer of value. You I said transfer. It's so good. It's so well. Mm -hmm. um, that's, it, that's, it, that's it why. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, is it okay? I mean, <laughs> it's blockchain is still hard. Yeah, I have that word, I don't know. Can they not have a nice word? Like, I don't know, like fruits, pears, <laughs> apple. Uh, yeah, no, that's another. No, really apple well. is blocked. <laughs> they cannot use it anymore. Mango, you know. <laughs> whatever. So you can transfer these um, assets. Mm -hmm. Good, hmm. but uh, you cannot only, I entered this sphere some maybe three years ago, uh -huh. I was working for the Austrian Research Fund, uh -huh. and we came with this research project to the point where energy hmm, could also be transferred. Not the energy itself that would kill the computer because of this, this big current, but you can measure the energy in form of kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. You can say, okay, I transfer to somebody photovoltaic, energy to another one and cut out the utility company. So directly transfer to a company who, mm -hmm. which needs funds, directly the, the funds. That's the idea. You can transfer kilometers. You can transfer, you can use it for car sharing. You say the unit is not euro or dollar mm -hmm. or Bitcoin, yeah, but it's kilometers. It's value, like you said before, beautifully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you actually, and that's, that's this disruptive and really revolutionary approach. It is. And I, I had to read about it and that's what I'm here I study this still I have still lots to learn I, people call me expert I'm mm -hmm. far from being expert because it's so rich and the applications are from supply chain energy so many uh, um, mm -hmm. applications and today uh, we're talking about sports well, yeah what's 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 doing this sport what, what do you mm -hmm. put the sport on blockchain hmm. um, actually in sports you can do a lot for instance, um, you can try to, with, with, with the blockchain, you can try to link people mm -hmm. on the one hand side who need funds for their whatever, what they do. And on the other hand side, you have investors. Uh, at the moment, so you can try to establish an ecosystem where you transfer the funds directly to people in need. Uh, it's, it's, for instance, you can think of charity. Uh, you can also transfer easily funds from people who in the first world, yeah, who mm. need, who have funds, directly to people in Africa who are in need. It still needs NGOs, it still needs uh, people who control this. Okay. I also think that banks will not die, you know, we will still have banks in, uh, in the moment. But what I see, blockchain opens a new door mm. to so many beautiful applications and sports is one of it. And I think Sportico, uh, as it's one of, uh, one of its kind, there is no other platform far away uh, uh, in this. So Sportico is uh, really trying to bring sports on blockchain, uh, brings uh, data on athletes on blockchain. So that's, that's the beauty also. Um, you, can, you can really try with Sportico to link athletes which want to uh, boost their career and, and finance it uh, through investors and not only the big investors, that's also the beauty. You know, blockchain is, has a community part also. It, yes. you, you, have, you have young, motivated people who now see the chances there um, that, they can, um, that they can be part of this 
big blockchain community and support the system. Lots of programmers, I work with, with lots mm -hmm. of programmers. I recently was in Moscow on the World Blockchain Summit. Mm -hmm. They told me, yeah, it's so cool. We just, we just program here. We, just, we don't care about money. We just want to do the coding. We love this improving the system. So mm. you have these grassroots people who try to improve this blockchain uh, technology. So there are thousands working <laughs> on it. As I heard, you actually were, let's say, one of the first who actually started working or loving the blockchain technology or the ecosystem. Tell me, so, uh, I mean, like before it was... I was correct. I, I was correct. Oh. I, I was definitely not one of the no, first, no, but, but I, was, I started some years ago. There were others who started much earlier. So, let's but, say right, first yeah. or in, in the beginning, before yes. it was cool, yeah? Maybe my love <laughs> is very big. My love to blockchain is very big. It's, it's, yeah. Good. Uh, okay, so this is, if we focus on sport. Yeah. Um, so this is, okay, of course, a summit of... Uh, blockchain and Sportico. Yeah. Uh, what's your sport? Uh, what do you love? I, I, oh, what I, <laughs> ice hockey. I play ice hockey since I was very young. Oh, good. And uh, it's, it's, I play not professional, mm -hmm. but I still play. So it's, it's quite some years. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of years I play. And I do this every Friday with the group here. Oh, I, I'm good. from Austria, so we have an Austrian team. Beautiful. And, and we play that. And I see there is the younger people now, younger crowds mm -hmm. following. And uh, in Austria, I have also the countryside where mm -hmm. they don't have so much chances. And I see that they have these kind of schools for ice hockey, for instance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These schools are completely underfunded. It's, and it's not only in Austria. There you go. Yeah. And this would help. You exactly. Think? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could bring a new crowd of mm -hmm. people, not only the clubs. Now it's confined to the clubs and, and, and really concentrated that clubs say, OK, he's good, he's not good, she is good, she's only not good. Only for the best, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, this would be a chance that you select an athlete, you like mm. him over the internet and say, OK, I will support his career directly. And that would be a good chance to bring new people together also, like mm -hmm. the internet. It's, it's the idea of the internet, but includes funds. That's mm. such a big difference. And for sports, I see just chance. I mean, just take also you could, you could bet on somebody. You, you need this sport betting, mm. this uh, funding of infrastructure. So there is also real estate uh, blockchain projects where we see that coming. So it could fund the infrastructure. Uh, but coming back to my sport, we love <laughs> ice hockey. Um, for instance, it could be a possibility to uh, support poorer countries. Mm -hmm. Countries, mm -hmm. maybe in ice hockey, it's, it's the northern part of the hemisphere in Africa. It's also play, but you could bring for sports people who are underprivileged. You could bring into, uh, give a chance. So ah, there, there is lots of hope. It's a chance. It's a hope. It's a hope. Ah, and and there it's, you go. it's a hope technology. This <laughs> is really nice talking to you. We're coming back, of yes. course. And really insightful. Thank you very much for Thank now. Thank you also. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, uh, so we actually are going forward because uh, the time is not on our side and we have a full schedule. So Roby will of course join me again later. And up next, Kevin is actually a creator of the infomercial making phrases like as seen on TV and wait there's more, part of the actually cultural landscape. He's also a co-founding board member of the Entrepreneurs Organization and one of the original sharks on the TV show Shark Tank, because we all know, yeah? So welcome, Kevin, to the summit. Hey, Kevin Harrington. I'm excited to be here. And thanks, thanks for listening uh, to some of my uh, uh, background. In fact, I, 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 I oftentimes will say, that video you just watched was scripted by my mother, okay, because it, it only talks about all the good stuff that has happened in my entrepreneurial career. Uh, today, I'm going to share with you some of the, uh, the downs that I've had. I've certainly had some great ups, but had some downs also, because that's what entrepreneurship's all about. So uh, welcome today to the Sportico Online Summit, and pleasure to be here. I just I want to ask many of you who have have been uh, followers of Shark Tank or seen Shark Tank over the years. How many recognize this guy that you see right there? Uh, Mr. Wonderful, right? Kevin O'Leary. Well, I always ask, do you know why he calls himself Mr. Wonderful? Well, there's a reason why. Because nobody else will, okay? So, uh, yeah, he's 
he, he is Mr. Wonderful, and uh, he certainly has been that way on Shark Tank as he's, he's built his brand, though, and, and I, I don't mean in any way at all. Kevin O'Leary is, is, is actually a pretty amazing guy, uh, has done fantastic in many of his ventures and raising capital, etc. But I, I want to share with you a couple things today. I want to keep this tight um, as we go through the process of sharing with you some of my entrepreneurial stories, a little bit about getting on Shark Tank, some of the challenges I ran into. And first of all, a lot of people stop me and they say, hey, how'd you get into that crazy as seen in TV business? How'd you get on Shark Tank? So we're going to go through a few of, of those things. So I want to go back to the early days when actually uh, take a look at this slide. This is when Discovery Channel was I was watching Discovery Channel and I just got cable TV and there was I get to the ch Discovery and I had all CNN and all these other channels but Discovery had color bars on the screen literally for six hours a day and I found out that the, the challenge with that was was that Discovery was only an 18 hour a day network they didn't have the funding to produce 24 hours a day of programming so so here I was watching ch Discovery all of a sudden it goes dark into the six hours and I said I've got to find something to put on that time because I can't, just can't believe that there's not going to be anything so I did a lot of uh, trade shows back in those days and I did the houseware shows and the hardware shows and the home shows and here it was at the Philadelphia home show and there's a guy standing there with a crowd around him he had a knife in his hand he was cutting through a coca-cola can through a hammer through a pair of sneakers through a muffler found out his name was Arnold Morris, but people were buying what he was selling. It was called the Ginsu Knife. And this became an amazing success because we, I said to Arnold, I want to film this presentation that he was demoing this knife so powerfully and selling the Ginsu Knife set that that's what we did. And the Ginsu became the world's, I call it the world's first viral video, creating a juggernaut of sales of 500 million dollars over the next number of years so so this is how i kind of got into infomercials seeing these demonstrators and these pitch guys at the shows going through knives going and taking knives through coca-cola cans and i met billy mays and tony little and many of these other folks and we took them all around the world and so this was a became a global business everywhere in the world you saw uh, bars on the screen we put our program so we were in Latin America we were in Europe we were in Asia we were in the Middle East and this company actually ended up becoming a public company on the New York Stock Exchange and I'll never forget the day when here we were and I've been ringing the bell and both on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ but this company we went from 50 million to 100 million to 300 million to 500 million in sales and this was a, a dollar a share $20 a share kind of success. So um, uh, back back in, this is, is the mid to late 90s. And so so I, I say this is sort of the, the days when, all pre-internet, by the way, so certainly nothing to do with blockchain, right? Um, and, and we're going to talk a lot more about blockchain here in a second. But this prompted my next phone call. I got a phone call from Mark Burnett. He's like, hey, would you like to come on this new show I'm shooting called Shark Tank? And I said, Mark, what's Shark Tank all about? I've, I've never heard about it. He said, I can't tell you. You got to sign an NDA. Get out here to my office and tell you all about it. And I, I, I told my wife, I said, hey, I'm going to go see Mark Burnett. He won't tell me what it's all about, but some show he's thinking about putting me on called Shark Tank. She says, oh, I know why he won't tell you. Just think about all the things he does to those crazy people on that Survivor show. Yeah, you're going to be on Shark Tank? Well, what do you want to be on that show for? So, yeah, then I'm thinking, wait, was there, are they putting people into Shark Tanks or what's going on here? So, anyway, obviously, no, it's a business show and had a lot of fun doing Shark Tank, 175 segments, and, it, and meeting Mark and all the people was fantastic. But this was a kind of a short-lived success period for me, although it lasted I, you know, I say short-lived. I, I had been in this SE to TV business for, for many years, but now I was seeing magazines and newspapers and TV declining, huge declines. In fact, 
let's talk about television all by itself. 50% decline in television viewership over the last few years. This is brutal. And then 56 million people have actually cut the cord. So, uh, you know, I'm the as seen on TV guy and people are running away from television. In fact, here's the worst slide of all. The line across is what we had to pay for the time, and the green line are the ratings. So while the ratings plummeted, we paid the same amount with the 50% decline in ratings, the same amount we had to pay. So this was brutal for us, which it, this next slide is going to tell you exactly how I felt, because here is my industry. I'm the founder of the, inf creator of the infomercial, a pioneer of Ad Seed and TV. We had thousands of products we owned, AsSeenandTV.com. We had every kind of asset, thousands of products. But what was happening, it was burning to the ground and just not a fun place to be. I don't know how many of you ever come into your office on a Monday morning and felt like this. But, you know, in fact, look at this <laughs> forest. We may have felt like this occasionally also. So, so now I had to do something. And and the, how many of you out there are entrepreneurs that have had challenges in your business or woke, you got up on a Monday morning and said, wow, things have changed. It's a little different. It's tougher. So I sought some advice and some assistance to take myself to the next level because I'm, I, you know, I, I got to share something with you right now. I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on coaches, mentors, masterminds. I went to Richard Branson's Necker Island and hung out with him in this amazing mastermind. And you know what Richard said to me? He says, Kevin, you need to get into this world of blockchain. Okay. So it's like, because I said, Richard, my business went up and now it's going down because te television viewership. He says, Kevin, you got to be checking out all the latest and the greatest because blockchain is so revolutionary. Ever, every major financial institution is implementing blockchain. And, and uh, certainly they're all in the research phases, but they're all going to be doing things in these arenas. Um, and in the world of, of, of crypto, Many, you know, many of the trading platforms are, are doing it now, but, but think about all the industries, property, energy, healthcare, food, all the different things. So it's blockchain is here to stay because it's decentralized. There's transparency and consensus amongst all the people using it. You get smart contracts, accountability and authentication. So, um, you know, in my world, it helps eliminate knockoffs because we get knocked off so quickly because our factories sometimes are selling our product right out the back door. So, um, so, so blockchain is gonna help in that area. In fact, um, if, if, if you haven't seen some of the articles out there, Inc. Magazine, Forbes, I'm, I'm getting interviewed now as I'm, I'm looking at my world of what have I been doing over the last number of years. I do fulfillment, so I'm involved with a company uh, that is, is in the fulfillment side of the business in a blockchain endeavor. Sportico is an amazing thing because Sportico is, 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 a, is, is a talent procurement blockchain company. So, so why am I excited about this? Because not only is Richard Branson involved, guys like Mark Cuban, other folks all around the world, it's, it is a major thing. And so um, I say that you need to be tuning in. So let me explain. I'll give you a quick case study. Tony Little, this was the Gazelle. And believe it or not, a product like the Gazelle ended up topping out at over a billion dollars in sales. But I will tell you that the profit structures got a little bit crazy. Now, you know, if you haven't seen the, the, the Tony Little Gazelle, here's Tony in action on the don't, you know, the, the, the actual product. So, so let me explain just the legacy way that we did business with the Gazelle. And it, it started out, I took a pitch from Tony Little, then we greenlit that pitch. Then we had to do the engineering and the tooling. Then we had to hire talent. And so start thinking now, Sportico, blockchain, right? Manufacturing and inventory, and then the production of the infomercial and the fulfillment of the product, the customer service, the retail distribution, the international distribution, but then came the knockoff. So this was the old way. And there was many millions of dollars in this legacy method of inefficiencies and knockoffs and broken contracts and mismatched data, lost shipments, 
um, the right talent sometimes maybe not getting paid. So this is why I say that when you're on fire, like we were with the NC and the TV logo, right? You need to embrace digital disruption and blockchain. And who better to listen to than somebody as smart as, as a Richard Branson. So, so let me just show you a slide that'll kind of summarize, you know, kind of how fast the world is moving. It took radio 38 years to get to 50 million listeners, TV 13, internet four years, iPod three, Facebook two, but the Pokemon Go got to 50 million downloads in 15 days. And here's the biggest one of all, Ed Sheeran got to 375 million downloads in one week. So this is where I asked the question, do you think the world's moving a little faster today than it was in the old days, right? And I, when I talk old days, I'm talking five years ago. So, so this is why blockchain is so important because I've spent billions of dollars on production, on talent, on filming, on fulfillment, on media, on contracts. But now I'm getting involved with many different kinds of companies, Sportico, Digits for Processing, Ship Chain for Fulfillment, Shark, Shark, Smart Chain Media for um, actually production of, of projects and, and videos and, and pitch investors live is another company where we're taking pitches on the internet. So, so I've taken literally my 40 years of experience in the world of legacy kinds of things where when I mentioned the Tony Little Lab um, uh, Gazelle product, for example, and now transitioning to blockchain with companies like Sportico and like I mentioned, ShipChain, where we take pitches via blockchain and we invest via blockchain and we sign smart contracts, we hire talent via Sportico and we produce shows via smart chain media, manufacturing, fulfilling, etc. By the way, global distribution also, and this is how all these this talent is going to make lots of money. So why, why Sportico? And this is obviously one of the reasons why we're here today. So I've made 40 years of investments. Um, and when you think about the sports, it's a, it's a 600 plus billion dollar industry. And it's, it's a, been a lifelong passion of mine being involved in the sports industry and all of the money that I've lost over the years with some of the poor investment information, some of these the contracts that were broken because they weren't smart contracts, this high barrier of entry in many cases, high risk, low reward, blockchain is clearly the solution. So uh, ShipChain has done amazing things. We, 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 we've taken one of the former heads of DHL who's now running ship chain and and they're they're in europe the middle east latin america eastern europe i lost tens of millions of dollars over the years and in, in money and you know sort of under the table deals corruption lost shipments um major inefficiencies and and broken uh, contracts so blockchain again was that solution so a dhl endorsed actually the need for um for having some kind of a blockchain solution and, and they've said ship chain is a solution as they've recognized ship chain. So this is pretty, pretty powerful stuff. So I always like to, to say, you know, when I get involved in investments, where are we on the bell-shaped curve of, of the evolution of the industry? Now, the evolution of infomercials, I got involved at the beginning as the creator and inventor of infomercials. And that was back in the early 80s. But now in the, in the 2000s, it peaked. And now as we're hitting 2018, 2019 coming up next year, we're in the back end of infomercials, but blockchain and technology were at the very beginning of the opportunity for blockchain. So now is the time to act. And I say that those that get in on the ground floor have a, you know, a, a, an opportunity to get in on a new, bottle, a new model of business and to be able to have these unbelievably unique qualities of blockchain in your business where it's decentralized, transparent, there's a consensus of all the people participating, you're using smart contracts, it's accountable and it's authenticated. And again, helping eliminate those knockoffs. So giving you instant global connectivity. So I think what we're talking about is the is the value of everything is that we create here resides in the hands of many rather than a few. So um, I think one of the guys that said it best is Buckminster Fuller. He says, you, you never change things 
by fighting the existing reality to change something, you got to build a new model. And this is what makes the existing model obsolete. So it makes total sense for me. And I think that's why many of us that are exploring the world of blockchain understand this. We're in on the ground floor. And again, I just want to thank each and every one of you for being here and being part of our, our online presentation. Uh, it's a few minutes out of your day to understand my perspective as an original shark, as the inventor of the infomercial. I'm excited to say that I'm all in for blockchain. Uh, Sportico is an amazing company. And I just, I'm going to give you the last four words from a, a friend of mine and a mentor to me also, Tony Little. Thank you, Kevin. Don't go away yet. I have a couple of questions for your, uh, from our uh, viewers, actually. What would you say, which industries other than sports will benefit most from the blockchain technology, by your opinion? So that, that's a great question about what other industries do I see blockchain uh, becoming powerful in. And I think, uh, let me just summarize this. In my world over the last 35 years, I have taken a lot of pitches. Uh, and, and so that, that's an area that blockchain is going to be providing documented pitching structures. Uh, that this is Pitch Investors Live is a company that, that does that kind of thing. So I take pitches that will be documented by blockchain with videos and statements of fact and smart contracts then with the people that have products. We also are then manufacturing good. So there's going to be blockchain on the manufacturing side of things. Then there's the fulfillment side of things. And this is ship chain is a, is a great example of that. Former DHL folks that are going to be able to provide authentication and documentation of the origins of the product and all of the, the channels of distribution as that product is, comes from the factory into warehouses in the U.S. and then gets shipped to the ultimate consumer. So, so you've got um, the pitch taking, you've got manufacturing, you've got uh, fulfillment, you're going to have distribution into retail stores, you're going to have, t uh, obviously, as we all know, talent. And um, um, it, it, Sporty Co. Is, is an amazing side of, of being able to find and get financing for, for major talent. We also got processing of the credit cards. And this is a company uh, called Digits that we're involved with. So um, as I keep going, insurance is another one that's, that's, that's coming out very shortly. There's also another one called Smart Chain Media uh, that uh, I'm, I'm involved with that has um, blockchain for production. And all of the dollars that get thrown into production, I've spent literally tens of millions probably hundreds of millions when it's all said and done on all the different productions that we've done in the hundreds and hundreds of projects. Um, and so production is very powerful in, in terms of having a blockchain component to it to be able to make sure uh, that things are, are happening in, in, the, in a proper fashion. So um, I think we've kind of covered a bunch. I'm sure there's a few that we missed, but uh, every aspect of, of, of my end of the business, you know, another one is media. That's another one. Uh, you know, customer service, et cetera. But uh, I, I think, you know, banking has always been a big one. And, and, um, and so finance, fintech, big areas to be looking at blockchain in the near future. You're also an advisor and co-owner of Sportico, who is hosting today's event. A question everybody is eager to hear you answer, of course, is where do you see Sportico, let's say, in a year? Great question, where, where I see Sporty Co. in a year. So, look, nobody has that crystal ball, but um, we always like to make projections and, and plans for the future. And as entrepreneurs, um, I'm very passionate about the projects that I get involved with. And, and, and I, I like to be thinking very positively about where these uh, ventures can go. And Sporty Co. Is, is, a, is, is significant out there in the marketplace because one of the things that I've been dealing with for so many years that have made so much success for me is amazing talent. 
So I'm, I'm talking about people like Tony Little and Jack LaLanne and uh, Billy Mays. I mean, Billy Mays was, was just a, a local guy from Pittsburgh that was selling automotive products. And we grabbed him out of the fairs and, and created, you know, a huge business out of his uh, 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 pitching abilities, right? And, and Tony Little, we did well over a billion dollars in sales with, with Tony. So make a long story short, though, Sportico is going to be the go-to place where talent is able to arrange some financing and meeting with sports organizations and clubs and 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 all of it kind of coming together in, in a big way. So I just believe that it it's time for a, a, a company like Sportico to be able to allow the whole industry of sports from the talent side um, in almost like a crowdfunding kind of a scenario, uh, provide some financing to then allow them to connect in with the right sports people, sports marketing, and, and clubs, et cetera, across the board as the go-to place. Sportico, that's what I'm hoping. Thank you, Kevin. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Moving on with our next speaker, we will focus a bit more on the sports industry and its nuances. Shanir Kurkuz is CEO and co-founder of American 7S Football League. The A7FL is disrupting the sport of American football with its format of 7-on-7. Seven seven. No helmets, no pads, full contact, tackle football. Chenier is a veteran of the sports industry and will offer us insight on the so-called backbend of the sports industry. Chenier, thank you for joining us. Can you please tell us a bit about about yourself and, of course, your background. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Shenner Corcuses. I'm a computer engineer and programmer um, by trade. I've become an entrepreneur over the years. In 2004, I founded EarthSkater, which is a software as a service e-commerce platform. And we help a lot of small business owners across the country and getting set up and do business online. We're very personalized and flexible. And throughout that time, I have been passionate about entrepreneurship. In 2014, I helped to co-found the A7FL, American Sevens Football League. And we are now an entertainment and TV destination and we're gaining fans across the country, across the world, it's amazing. And how important is a new technology for sports league? Yeah, technology is extremely important for a sports league, especially a new one like the A7FL. We are a startup and we have all of the hurdles and obstacles that a startups face. Um, and that technology helps to bridge the gap and, and help us to scale much faster and much more efficiently and cost effectively. Blockchain technology is something in specific that we have our eyes on. Um, but I can tell you the A7FL has got tremendous value in our video production. Our fans love it. The sport is viral and engaging. It's football with no pads, no helmets, full contact. And believe it or not, there's an elevated safety angle to the game in, in the ways that it's similar to rugby no helmets, no repetitive head-to-head -head shots. Um, because of all of this, we're using technology to our advantage to produce our videos ourselves. And in this season, we're on TV with 11 sports where we're producing those games in-house, self-produced, and technology has a huge role in that. And how can a sports league team or an athlete leverage new technology? Okay, so as a sports league, a uh, major factor is you need to get the, the games out there. You need to put it out to the audience. And that means production and production costs. It's an expensive business. It costs anywhere in the range of 10,000 to 15,000 to produce for television. It costs anywhere in the range from five to 10 plus to produce for Facebook and digital streaming venues. That being said, a single person with a cell phone 
in today's day and age can live stream on their own to Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and any number of platforms. And at the same time, a crew, an experienced crew like the A7FL production team is able to leverage technology to not only produce for digital platforms like our new partnership with Facebook Watch, but also for television with 11 Sports Network, where we're producing those games ourselves. It's a major milestone for us. As a sports insider, what is your opinion on blockchain? Blockchain is an emerging technology. It's an evolution of technologies, um, most notably the idea of spreadsheets and databases um, have, have now evolved into a more robust distributed solution based and, 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 um, and known as blockchain and the distributed ledger. That being said, I think there's huge opportunities in sports to use blockchain technology, not only in the compensation of athletes, the funding of teams, the funding of athletes, and, but also in the third party partnerships, such as in fantasy sports, the A7FL is actively seeking partnerships in fantasy football around the A7FL platform, and also how that extends into the gambling and gaming arena across the world using blockchain and potentially the cryptocurrencies that are associated to, to manage those processes. And how are you planning to incorporate blockchain technology into A7FL? Thank you, yeah, the A7FL's um, very interested in emerging technologies. Obviously we've been taking advantage of and have received great benefit um, from our work with various technologies and blockchain is, a, is one of the newest that we're engaging with. We are learning more about, we're investigating, we're testing and we're seeking to form partnerships um, in and around companies that are using blockchain technology where it's going to benefit and be a win-win for both parties. The A7FL needs to benefit our teams and our athletes and expand our league across the United States and then globally. Investors and, and other third parties are able to then use the blockchain and potentially our associated cryptocurrencies, which we're looking at, to fund athletes, fund teams, fund the A7FL's ventures, and, and whether that's in the United States or internationally, it's all made more efficient and effective through blockchain. Your league is a new player on the block. How can blockchain give smaller leagues the advantage against major, well-established competitions? It's a great question. I think um, obviously smaller leagues and smaller businesses and organizations in general are more flexible, more adaptive, more uh, quick to make changes and pivot. Um, whereas the larger organizations are maybe slowed down by bureaucracy to some degree. Uh, that, you know, that's natural, I believe. So blockchain is just another tool in the toolbox and, and and, um, and one that's going to be ever more prevalent as time goes on. Um, and yeah, I definitely think if you give a smaller league, a league like the American Sevens Football League, an advantage um, in being first to market or one of the first to leverage those technologies to scale our league across the country and internationally, that's our goal. And one more question, this one from our viewers who are football fans. It seems having a new full contact American Football League has raised quite some interest among our viewers. 
So could you go into a little more details on your latest project, the A7FL? That's a great question. The A7FL is no pads, no helmets, full contact football. If you can imagine American football played with no pads and no helmets, that's the A7FL. There are a few major differences. We are seven on seven. NFL football is 11 on 11. We have certain rule changes to make our game safer. There's no kicking in the A7FL. Our special teams are done through a three on one special teams, which is special teams traditionally the most dangerous part of American football. So for our fans across the world who, who are especially familiar with rugby, we keep the full contact of football, American football, the same kind of contact that you love to see in rugby, but this is American football. You get to throw the passes for touchdowns and all of the other excitement that comes with the game. And it's better for our athletes, no repetitive head to head hits like you see when you're wearing helmets. It's very entertaining. We're gaining fans across the country and we hope you'll watch us. Join us on a7fl.com and Facebook. You can find us at a7fl and a7fl TV. We're coming to you live this season on Facebook Watch and 11 Sports Network. Shanera, thank you and good luck in setting up a new Excite Me exciting sports league. And to all of our viewers, do tune into the next A7 FL season. It's an exciting sport. Our next speaker comes from the UK, Chris Hartfield. Well, guys, uh, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be uh, a speaker here on the World Sport Blockchain Summit, the, um, the, the first of its kind. So, uh, yeah, it's very nice to be here. And, um, you know, by, by way of a very brief introduction about myself, uh, I'm a co-founder of a sports agency that's been um, in operation for, uh, for the best part of a decade now. Uh, we work across a number of sports, uh, namely football, Formula One, cricket, rugby, athletics. Um, and uh, we have a, a lot of activity based on the athlete management side of professional sports, and we also represent brands uh, within sports. So uh, we'll be giving a sort of an opinion based on those, uh, on how it, how the sports world and, and uh, certainly the blockchain industry is affecting those two particular parts of the sports industry. And, um, and, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Chris, welcome to the summit. We have a long history of involvement in the sports industry. What would you say has changed the most since you started? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of change generally um, in sport. I think I, I always think that the advancement of technology is what's changed sport, but it's it's not just changed it in the way that um, perhaps in motorsport cars are getting faster or or or, or something like the, 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 the technology side does for that. I think if you actually look at sports like football, it's changed things dramatically in the sense that even our understanding of nutrition the understanding of how players train and all of that side of things. Um, it's been it's been something that's quite big. So I, I guess if I was to say what's the biggest uh, or what has changed significantly the most, I think it's it's generally the advancement of our understanding uh, of the athletes themselves. Um, if you were to look at um, a footballer 20 years ago, compare him nowadays to a Cristiano Ronaldo, I think physically there are huge differences in what that sportsman looks like, their speed, their agility, their skill. Um, it's changed dramatically. And I think that's been based largely upon the understanding that we have of technology. Um, and I think, and, and, and certainly how that technology is used. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people here know about the, the way that we're now using the, the technology to support referee decisions. I mean, this is something that, again, is, is very new and it's, uh, um, it's a new technology that's perhaps saving us from these terrible decisions that perhaps cost games or teams matches. Um, so that certainly, that certainly for me is, is really, in a nutshell, it's technology has changed and the sports world is embracing it and, and, um, and utilizing it. 
What would be the biggest challenges facing the industry today? Well, I think the the biggest challenges for me is sport, unlike any other industry, is it's continuing to grow. We have more fans, more engagement, players' endorsement fees are going up, um, transfer fees are going up. So the popularity of the sport is clearly growing on an annual basis. So I think as far as what do we challenge, well, how do we support that growth? Um, you know, nowadays, the fan that supports um, a football club or a Formula One team or whichever is, is very much regarded as being a millennial. They spend a lot of their time following sports in different ways than perhaps we used to in years gone by. Most of it's sensitive from a mobile phone, through social media channels and things like that. So I think it's what is the biggest challenge we've got? For me, it's how do we support or continuing to support the growth in sport? How do we continue to make it engaging for the millions of people that are watching the sports and how do we keep growing them? Um, that's going to be the biggest challenge we face. And, um, you know, and it's going to be interesting to see how the various different sports teams and clubs, how they tackle that question. Which technologies, if any, will radically change the face of sports in the near future, in your opinion? Well, there's a lot of new technologies. I think, you know, AI, VR, blockchain, these are all new, new technologies which are being pioneered at the moment. Um, quite how they're used and implemented within sport is going to be interesting to see. Um, I mean, for me, I, again, I, I sort of almost go back to the second question that you had regarding the challenges that we face today and how technology can fix those challenges. For me, having a, a virtual reality uh, program or, or, or an AI program or, or something where you can actually say to fans, hey, we're going to give you, you're going to be in the locker room at halftime. We're going to give you, you're going to be sat there listening to the talks that the manager gives and, and so forth. I think it's engaging the, the, the fans and, and engaging people to break down the barriers between the professional sportsman and the fan. How do we bridge that gap and more, move them closer together? Um, you know, and I think actually as much as AI, VR, that they all have a part in that, I think blockchain has a part in, in that too. I think the blockchain creates a community that, that we're seeing through you know, the purchase and acquisition of tokens, et cetera. And I think that in years to come, uh, that's going to be something which sports teams are going to implement. I mean, it's not a far-fetched uh, concept to think, why can a sports club or a sports team that has millions and millions or billions of fans internationally, how can we create a, a community for those fans? And I think blockchain and the tokenization, perhaps, of sports teams is a great way of doing that. You're mostly working in motorsports. What would be your advice for a talented driver on the onset of his or her career? Sure. Well, I mean, I think in, in motorsport, it's, um, I mean, motorsport is an, it, it, kind of like any other sport, what you ultimately want to try to do initially is you want to tell yourself or ask yourself the question, where do I want to be? Um, some drivers, in, in, if you're a young driver, you may see yourself being, a Formula One driver, maybe that's your goal. Perhaps you want to be a sports car driver, you want to win Le Mans, uh, or a NASCAR driver, or, or an Indy car driver. And I think that ultimately the, the, the key concept that I think that, that's really important for young drivers is to establish where do I want to be and what is required for me to get there and, and work backwards from that point. Um, if you want to be a Formula One driver, for example, these days, you've got to be able to carry yourself very well with brands. You've got to be able to interact with people very well. You've got to have a technical understanding of racing cars and, and what value you can bring to a team. And I think if you understand that, that idea, you can then go back to your effectively three years before that point and think, right, well, what, what do I need to do? How do I build myself to being that product that these teams want? Um, you know, I think a lot of people go into it perhaps uh, with a slightly you know, dream or attitude as to I, I desperately want to be a Formula One driver or I desperately want to be to win the Indy 500. But, you know, I think you have to break it down into small steps and understand how do I go about that. Um, and I think as well, most importantly, is create a team of people around you. You know, I think we all we're all well aware that no one person can be the, the jack of all trades. But, 
you know, I very much think that the key of, of any of these things is to surround yourself with people that can help you achieve your goal uh, and create that network around you. Can you share a success story you're especially proud of to our viewers? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, as, as I said, I mean, we, we work as a company, we work across two platforms. One of them is brand representation and, and one of them is, is athlete representation. So um, for me, I, I can kind of give an example uh, on each. Um, from, the, from, from the athlete side, we took a young driver who was, um, he was a, a vice world karting champion and a European karting champion. And we took him all the way through from grassroots motorsport through to the Indy 500. Um, and we took him on, on the various different paths and levels. He won numerous races and championships and was an exceptional talent. And I was really proud of that specifically because motorsport has got huge financial demands on, on drivers. The participation number, um, I, I guess the cost of participation is extremely high. So it's not like football where you need a pair of boots and off you go, you know, motor racing, it, there's, there's huge costs involved in that. And we broke down those barriers for him. And we, we enabled talent to, um, to, to actually shine and, and to, to be able to sort of not have to worry about the limitations that normally face the industry. Um, we were very proud of that and, and continue to be extremely proud of him uh, as a driver um, and, um, and, and wish and, and you know, long wish that he continues to, to do all that he can. Um, I think that on the brand side, we did, a, uh, we did a piece where a lot of companies these days, they look at sport as a, oh, certainly we help them understand that sport can be used to grow a business. Um, the, the support, the, the, the fanatical approach that fans have to sport and just the sheer TV numbers and volume that sport conduct, uh, um, commands these days is, is, is something that brands have historically leveraged themselves on. Um, and there was a company called Plus 500 who, um, who we worked with as an agency and represented them. And we, we worked with them, I think that began maybe five or six years ago, and we brought them into sport. They used their, um, their company and leveraged themselves with, with uh, Atletico Madrid. Uh, they became the front of shirt sponsorship with that. And that was, it was really a case to try and give a company that is effectively a tech company. It's a trading company that has apps, etc. And we use sport to give them a heartbeat, to give them an identity, to show the world that they exist and, and, um, and to give them the, the platform that they needed to really globally approach uh, and reach out to a lot of fans and show them their product. And, they're a company that's been massively successful. Um, they obviously operate a fantastic company. And um, they've, uh, we're thrilled that the growth that they've experienced directly correlates to the time that they've spent within sports sponsorship and specifically with Atletico Madrid. Um, equally, they wanted to access a new market in Australia or grow in a new market. And we sat down with them. We talked about a strategy to do that. And they wanted to continue to to use sport as a platform to grow their business. They became the front, the, the front of shirt sponsor for the Brumbies, which is one of the, the top uh, uh, rugby teams in Australia. And they're seeing the same kind of growth. So, you know, it's for us, it's fantastic to see sport is, is, a, is a mechanism that companies can use, if um, certainly if used correctly, to grow their business. And we're really pleased not just to help sportsmen grow their careers, but brands as well. As someone working with sports talents, do you see Sportico as competition or as a welcome addition to the sports industry? To be honest, I, I very much see Sportico as a company, um, for me, that are really breaking down barriers in the sports sector. I mean, I, I met uh, Marco and Simon for the first time uh, several months ago, and the, the vision that they have for Sportico as a business, for me, is... It's, it's revolutionary and it works. You know, there are barriers in the world um, that, that if you are a sports enthusiast, how do, you, how do you get involved in the sports sector? How do you support a young footballer or a young racing driver? And the truth of it is it, that that platform doesn't exist. Um, you know, one of the questions that you had was, how do, we, how do we use technology or which technology could change? Well, I think certainly in the advancement of 
of an athlete. I think what Sportico are doing in the way that they're creating a platform to engage fans to help support um, young athletes pursue their goal is 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 one that will change the game and, and certainly one that I believe is is absolutely necessary. Um, and to be honest, I, I welcome it. You know, as someone in the sports sector, I want to be able to go to guys like Sportico and say, hey, I've got I've got the next uh, Indy 500 winner or I've got the next Formula One world champion, but I need some help in order to get some support for this young driver. But I want that help to be rewarded by somebody having a percentage of, of this guy's future. I mean, I think in a, in a very primitive way, it's used in sport these days, perhaps in horse racing, where a group of guys get together and they all buy a share of a racehorse. Um, and it works. People do it. But why are we stopping at race horsing and uh, at horse racing? Sorry. Um, and I think that Sportigo have really identified that. And, and are trying to break that barrier down, and, and you know I'm I'm thrilled to be working with them, and um, and wish them wish that we both have a great deal of success together. Chris, thank you for your insight, and good luck with your future sports endeavors. Thanks very much for inviting us to to speak. Our next guest has a long history of entrepreneurship who has taken a new challenge, becoming the president of a basketball club. Everyone following Sportico already heard of him, Niko Klanšek, president of Basketball Club Slovan from Ljubljana, Slovenia, who set up the first investment campaign on the Sportico platform. Niko is joining us today from Hong Kong. Hello, Niko. Great to have you at the summit. Let's start with an easy one. Tell us about yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Niko Klanšek, I'm uh, the president of uh, the Slovenian professional basketball club uh, Slovan. Uh, Slovan is actually a very old uh, basketball club uh, from the uh, capital of Slovenia, Ljubljana. Um, it was established in 1951 and last year in 2017 I, uh, my dream came true and I became a president of the basketball club of Slovan. Uh, originally, I'm from Slovenia. I also used to play basketball. I actually started playing basketball in uh, Club Slovan, uh, went to the United States, studied there at the university, and then I started my two companies, uh, one in smoothies, one in uh, electric bikes. I've uh, successfully sold them. And for the company with the electric bikes, we've done two Kickstarter campaigns, uh, successful ones. Uh, and then I also helped more than 50 successful crowdfunding campaigns uh, to successfully raise funds on uh, Kickstarter and other platforms. And um, also now I uh, advise and invest into, uh, into uh, blockchain projects. And um, um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, sum up about me. And please, Nico, tell us something more about the challenges of facing, you are actually facing in sports today. Uh, yeah, so basically sports is like a startup, right? Or it's like an accelerator where, you know, you have uh, the club, especially Slovan. What is Slovan? Slovan, uh, uh, it's a, a development team where we develop young players into a great athletes, great basketball players that they then can go and continue their professional uh, careers. That's our goal, that's our motto. So it's our motto, our goal, it's not really to be number one, to win every championship, to come and become, uh, to play in the EuroLeague. It's really more into in developing players. And this was the, the culture of the, pro, of the Slovanians. This is from the beginning. So really one of the best basketball players coming from Slovenia. I actually started playing basketball in Slovan. So we have Goran Dragic, Zoran Dragic, Nesterovic, Lakovic, um, Vidmar, uh, many more uh, basketball players that started in Slovan and then came uh, and then went to play in NBA, play in EuroLeague, uh, play in the, the top level basketball teams. And yeah, so the the problem here is that it's a long-term investment, right? So you you get a player, you 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 know you have a coach, you have a infrastructure, you have every day you work with them, you know, and this is years and years of uh, hard work and practice and really developing a player. 
And then usually, you know, a few, two, three players out of each generation come out to be a, a good uh, and successful so that you can actually then sell this player to a, to a team that wants to compete or to a higher league where they can play and continue to develop. And so, you know, it's a long-term investment. Uh, so that's why usually, you know, you cannot really uh, have many different uh, uh, channels of revenue uh, uh, since, uh, because of the... Um, because it's a long-term investment and also since we are not really a, a public team that will be competing and have a lot of fans you know the sponsorships it's more you know again the sponsorship ha sponsors have to understand that this is for developing players it's not to you know be on the tv um, yeah and that's probably the the biggest um, obstacle in you know how to actually get the financing in and then continue to develop great players Slovan is a small club, the seeder of talent for bigger sports outlets. There are probably some unique challenges to financing a smaller club, even in big sports like basketball. Uh, yes, yeah, so especially also, you know, uh, Ljubljana comes from, uh, I mean, Slovan comes from a small town, Ljubljana. Still, still it's a capital of uh, Slovenia, but Slovenia only have 2 million people population. Ljubljana has only 300,000 people population. So also our pool of, you know, players that we can pick from, it's smaller, right? Again, Slovan is coming from the neighborhood. So the region in Ljubljana, that is the biggest one. And actually we have uh, very, a lot of uh, uh, players coming from, uh, from this region, from this neighborhood. But still we need to look beyond Ljubljana. We need to look throughout the whole Slovenia and, in, and sometimes in most of the cases outside of Slovenia, especially in the former Yugoslavia countries where, you know, former Yugoslavia, it's really good in basketball. And they are really, the, they have always had to produce very talented players that play on the top level in, in around the world. So, you know, you have to look into the players around uh, Yugoslavia, around Slovenia, and uh, this is then additional cost because you have to actually move them to come closer to, to, to live in Ljubljana, to, to study in Ljubljana, to, you know, to, to practice in Ljubljana. And uh, luckily for us, we have a great partnership with uh, uh, Ljubljana uh, University for sports that is actually across the street from our, our uh, basketball club. So we can work with them very closely and we also work with, really closely with a very good uh, high school. So we provide them the education, we provide them the home where they can stay uh, eat, sleep, rest, uh, study, and but yeah, this again comes with uh, additional costs. What are potential revenue streams for a club like Slovan? Yeah, yeah. So of course, uh, the most obvious one is of uh, selling the players. Uh, so you know, you 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 get a player, you develop it, and in, uh, usually it, it's around four to six years that you would then sell a player and the way it works is basically you you collect some you collect points points so the the, the slovenian basketball association uh, created this point list that says okay if uh, a player is uh, uh, playing one year at the uh, 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 some level he gets this many points if he plays for the national team gets more points and con and this way it comes up and then you know after four to six years uh, these players would get a lot of points that then you can go the, uh, then when he wants to go to a bigger team or to a better team in Slovenia for example they would they, we would be able to negotiate with them to to pay us the, by these points that's one thing if they want to go to European uh, 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 out uh, into European uh, teams um, of course then you know that the price can be higher because that means that the player is uh, it's a very successful and it has a lot of potential so we can negotiate a higher price and of course if he goes to the nba street directly from us uh, you know i think it's now it's around one million dollar uh, price that the nba teams will pay for player that comes from your team and is drafted to the nba um, so that's another option then also an option is that you would uh, actually not sell your player right away, uh, for example, to Slovenian team or to European team, but you would uh, make a deal that you lend them the player 
or that only they pay 50% and then 50% is paid when the new contract is signed or when the when they go to the NBA or when they go to an, another European team. So this way you are basically, again, uh, somehow investing and really believing in this player that in two or three years playing for another team with another level will actually their, it's, uh, his or her value will increase. So that's one, and that's the most important uh, uh, value, uh, the revenue stream. Uh, the second uh, st uh, stream is, of course, sponsorships, but mostly the local local uh, teams, um, sorry, the local sponsors, the local businesses that wants to support a healthy lifestyle, that wants to grow the uh, to invest into the community, give them the opportunity to to do the sports and uh, things like this so that's uh, another one and then the third one is the basically it's uh, also very for the community the local community is the merchandise right so you know the brand the merchandise the practice to, to uh, practice gear uh, things like this and then the fourth one which are we trying now with the slovan is actually to create events so we do the some uh, summer events summer camps uh, that we organize for players and for also for uh, now we want to do also for uh, players, the former players that want that will come back to Slovan because this is their home and that they can during the off season, they can train and practice for the next season, right? And they can come together and train. So we want to organize this. And then we're also organizing a lot of uh, local events. So like street basketball, like also some cleaning uh, cleanup events and things like this. So this revenue would be, you know, participation, uh, uh, fees or again sponsorships and then uh, the last one which I'm really passionate about is actually we are trying to create a um, uh, recreational uh, league or recreational uh, pickup games for our parents of the players or for our community that uh, they can also play basketball so that they don't just uh, cheer for the or come watch our games but they can actually also play for the for the they can also play basketball so that's uh the the one revenue that and the one uh, um, product that we are working on that we are going to launch it uh, next season and nico do you believe crowdfunding is a vital option for a sports club uh, yeah definitely and i think that uh, crowdfunding is probably perfect thing for for sports in general you know because uh, all of the the success of crowdfunding is like how big your community is and how big of support it is and you know the sports and the sports team have the biggest uh, usually have the biggest communities and the biggest support right so this comes in hand in hand the crowdfunding and the sports uh, also i believe that you know People really believe in, in uh, like, if you are a fan of a team, or if you are, if you went through like uh, playing basketball, like me, I I went through, I played basketball or organized basketball for ten years, you know. So you know, seeing a, a, a team, you know, I want to help it because I know how they're what they're going through, and I I believe in this, so I want to support them. So you know, like buying a jersey and wearing it and showing the support. Is also by doing a crowdfunding. You know, it's the same thing in doing the support. And what I really see is that you know, I'm a, like if I'm a fan of a team, I'm already engaged. I already am a big supporter. So why not also to contribute some uh, money to it, or you know, some uh, donation or uh, investment? And this way, I'm actually even more than uh, uh, connected with the team, and I'm really there. And I'm I, I can feel like a part of the team because I help them from the beginning or help them from you know to, to do to get to the next level to the next step. We already mentioned that Slovan set up the first investment campaign on Sportico. Tell us a bit more on your future plans and what do you plan to do with the funds raised on the platform? I'm actually uh, very happy and uh, honored that. Uh, the uh, basketball club Slovan is uh, one of the first campaigns on Sportico, and um, we launched it uh, just a few weeks ago. And basically, the idea behind this that we are raising uh, funds uh, through the SPF tokens, and uh, with these funds, we will invest into infrastructure, 
to include to do to make a better infrastructure for our players to invest in more coaches and to especially like trainer coaches and physiotherapists and uh, also to get some more equipment uh, for the better uh, training and so why we're doing this because again we want to continue to imp uh, to improve our players and to build our players to become much better and to in increase their potential to be uh, uh, to be successful and uh, in return for the our supporters our investors on the sportico uh, we offer that we will give 50 percent of all our proceeds of sales of the players for the next five years, the 50% of these proceeds will go back to the investors. Do you have a message for the Sportico community and everyone following the summit? Yeah, so everyone, please uh, go to all our social networks. So we are on Facebook, uh, Kade Slovan. We're on Twitter, uh, YouTube. Uh, what else? We are on Instagram, Kade Slovan. So please come and follow us. Uh, also, me personally, I will join on the Sportico Telegram and do the a &M. Uh, So come there, ask me any question. I'll be happy to answer. And last but not least, uh, come to, go to Sportico and please support our campaign, Kade Slovan. And uh, hopefully we can build the next, uh, next big superstar, super basketball star that will come from Slovan to NBA and uh, maybe one day win a championship. Thank you, Nico. You heard him. If you want to ask questions, join our Telegram channel. Nico will be there after the, we wrap up the summit, ready to be grilled by the community so you don't miss the opportunity to participate in the discussion afterwards. And we are staying in the world of sports, but let's bring a little bit of the crypto world back into the mix. Joining us for the short interview is Tristan Cholri. Tristan is a CEO of Fryag, remaining healthy coaching with the help of technology. Fryag is currently working on raising funds with a token sale, so his pers perspective from the crossroads of crypto and sports will be an interesting one, I am sure. Hi, Anya. Thank you for the introduction. And of course, thank you for having me here. A little bit about myself. My name is Tristan Chaudhry. I am the CEO of Fryag. Fryag is an online marketplace that allows personal trainers, dietitians, and nutritionists to create and design their own fitness programs. And I started Fryag about six months ago. And I've been involved in the cryptocurrency space ever since 2012 when I was in high school. I believe I was a sophomore in high school when I started. And what I was doing was I was just putting, I put a lot of my life savings into Bitcoin early on. I thought it blew up and it did. It really grew. And of course, after the crash happened, uh, I had to turn to altcoins to do some more investments. And I really started to get into the ICO scene. And throughout high school and early college, I saw ICOs really start to blow up and I had to get involved. I saw my background is in coding. So I saw a unique opportunity here, which I'm sure everyone in the ICO space can see how legitimate it has become. It started out as some fairy tale way of making your dreams, you know, really materialize and having a concept just come to fruition, having, having decentralized funding for platforms. That's a lot like what you do at Sportico with athletes. And I think it's, I think it's amazing, but I think everyone here can say that in the ICO scene, we're seeing something that's really never been occurred in human history before. We're seeing companies and individuals gather around ideas and just be able to create something like like never before but i love it i love every second i'm in the crypto space and um i i think sportico is a phenomenal project and i'm like i said honored to be here well it's a it's a very interesting question um in a world where everything's changing so quickly and so fast and so dr drastically. I think sports actually has been one of the least affected. If you think about it, how much has baseball changed over the last 60 years or soccer? How much has football changed, you know, besides the players and, you know, the, the methods of viewing? So I think there's something that's comforting about that to people, that sports is just, you know, it's player versus player, even playing field for most sports. 
and uh, it, it, for the most part, it hasn't changed. So one of the main difficulties, and I think both of our companies can relate to this, is getting the people to adapt to change, getting the players of sports or getting the people who are in fitness, in our case, to adapt. And what I mean by that is the equipment, for the most part, has stayed the same, the, the rules, but not much has changed. And in the case of Sportico, you're going to be changing a lot of things. You're going to be changing how players get to the next level through their funding. In the case of Fryag, we're going to be changing how uh, clients in the fitness area are communicating and interacting with their fitness coaches and their health coaches and even their sports coaches. So I think there's a lot of synergies here uh, between our companies. And there's a lot of things we have in common as far as the obstacles we have to overcome. But definitely it's an issue. But it's not a bad issue. I mean, it's something that's got to happen. Every industry changes. That's just the world we live in. Blockchain is um, a perfect example of that. And it's coming to sports. Blockchains and this technology in itself is just going to come to every single industry there is. And the world better be ready to change with it. But I'm going to be very interested to see how sports like soccer, like American football, baseball, um, even 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 sports like track and field and cross country adapt and change as the new technology comes. Fitbit is a prime example of how people are incorporating that into sports, even just wearable technology in general. The Apple Watch, you see players endorse and they play and they show their heart rate and how they use it and how it's being able to be used with the sports they're playing and how it's improved their athletic performance and their endurance and it's gained, gained insights into exactly what's going on in their body. I think medical is going to have a lot of overlaps in this, seeing your blood pressure, your blood rate, making sure your medications are you know, doing anything negative to the sports you're playing. And that's something we're looking at too. We want to make sure all of your devices, your Fitbit bands, your Garmin bands, the apps you're using all can sync to your coach and they can see exactly what's going on. But just like any new technology, the main, the main hurdle to overcome is educating the public and educating the users and getting them over that learning curve because that's just a curve they're going to have to come across at some point or another. And the good thing about having ICOs and companies like ours is that the change is coming regardless. We're just one of some of the first movers in the industry. The One of the good things we have going for us is we're in a relatively uncrowded space. There's not many blockchain projects that are dabbling in sports and fitness. So we're... Um, we're the leaders of the pack, and the fact that we're first movers will definitely give us a huge advantage. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question, and like I was saying about the sports and fitness industry as a whole with tech, the main issue is education, educating your consumers about the services you're providing. But I think the fact that our ICOs are dabbling in some of the buzzwords people hear on the news like blockchain and cryptocurrency and Bitcoin may have gone thrown around here or there. I think that's part of the allure. People want to know what this new technology is and how it could possibly relate to sports and fitness and health coaching. So I think it's also a great tool for marketing, having people understand that Blockchain is going to touch every single industry there is, not just finance, not just security, but sports, financing, um, fitness, coaching, communication, everything, every industry there is in the world will be touched by blockchain at one point, in my opinion. And that's a strength and a weakness for, for both of our ICOs. But I know that Sportico has a very niche market and it's very specific and they're supplying a great, um, a great product a great service to a very, very specific need. And that's the recipe for success. Sportico has a great platform and they have a lot of good things going. It's a little more difficult for Fry because we have such a broad market and pretty much anyone looking to get in shape, which I mean, that's that's all of us. We're all looking to lose a few pounds. We're all a little chubby or we all want to gain some muscle. We all want to take our athletic performance to the next level. But so it's, it's, it's very difficult to target everyone. But with Sportico, I think it's it's phenomenal that you have such a targeted demographic of people who could use this. I, I think you guys are going to change lives. And the fact that you guys have incorporated blockchain to such an extent that it can make the world and athletes be able to achieve their dreams is, is inspirational. 
we would love to use um, some of the lessons that you guys have learned over the past several months during your ICO for ours because our goals are very similar. We want to make the world a healthier place, a better place, and we want to make people's dreams come true. Great. So our ICO, Fryeg, we're doing an initial security token offering for our platform that is existing. And it's uh, the MVP is up there on Fryeg.com, F-R-Y-E-G-G.com. And our mobile app is actually coming out in about one week, one or two weeks, putting the finishing touches on that. But essentially what we're doing is we're allowing personal trainers, dietitians, and nutritionists to create and design their own fitness programs and supplement their current income at the gym or even replace their entire income and create a full-time job just like Uber does with the taxi industry. The way it works is clients, so if you're a college student, you're on a budget, you want to get in shape, you want to get ripped for spring break or for the summer, but you don't have $60 to spend for a half an hour training session at the gym. You go on Fryeg, you type in your goal, maybe it's to build muscle, or maybe it's to lose fat, maybe you do a body detox, whatever it may be. We have pretty much something for everyone. You go on there and you search for a program that fits your needs. There will be programs for anyone. Maybe you're looking for a seven-day quick shred. Maybe you're looking for a whole 90-day complete transformation. But different coaches create their own programs and they brand them. So a coach named Susan could create Susan's 30-day fat shredder. And you join that program and essentially you work with that coach. They give you your meal plans, your workout plans. They give you all the guidance and motivation you need for the entire program, for the entire duration of the, uh, the program that you joined. And what we do is we take the data that you share with your coach if you want to enroll in the health API program. So it's completely optional. And we pay you for that data in tokens. We will pay the client for their data. And we take, get rid of their name, we get rid of their location, and we take that data so maybe their meal data, their workout information from that synced from their Fitbit bands and their Garmin bands. And we sell that information to third parties who are looking and could use that data on our API. So let's say Pfizer, let's say um, Aetna, or maybe a government agency or a university school project. They want data. They need some data. They want to say, I want to know who on the keto diet has lost more than 20 pounds over a 30-day period. And it shows, boom. 100 people have lost more than this amount of pounds in this amount of days, and here are all the statistics on how they did it. Maybe if you're a medical company, you can see how people with different diseases lost weight or built muscle or whatever it may be over a certain period of time. And it's really just great insight into how people are living their lives and how to make the world a healthier place. And I think it's in the wake of Facebook and all of these hacks like MyFitnessPal, having all their data exposed. Uh, the the users really feel slighted because they're giving the data, they're helping to run the business and they get nothing in return. With us, it's a different story. And keep in mind, this is completely optional. Some people don't want to share their information and that's perfectly fine. But the way the blockchain makes this better is because we allow it to be secure on a private blockchain database and completely transparent to anyone who inserts the tokens. The key is the data is sold only for tokens, not cash. And that's what gives the tokens value. Thank you, Tristan, for joining us, and I wish you a lot of success in raising funds from investors. But now, a sad news. This is the time when Charlie Schramm was supposed to join our live stream live from New York, but as he's currently on the road, there are some unforeseen technical problems. So Charlie sends his regards in, and his lecture will be available on the VEPS Summit in a couple of days. Charlie needs no introduction to the crypto community as he's a part of this world from the very beginning. So I'm sure this will be an interesting lecture to tune into. But we have another crypto celebrity joining us now. So all is well. Philip Nunn has over 15 years of experience in financial services and specializes in wealth management angel investment, commercial property investment, and financial technology. He founded the Blackmore Group in 2013 and is one of the best known online influencers in the blockchain and crypto space. Philip will be launching his own crypto fund soon that looks into investing the ICOs along 
with existing blockchain technology companies. Philip Nan, welcome to the summit and the stage is all yours. Hi there, good evening Anya, thank you and uh, yeah, it's nice to join you guys. How's everything going? Philip, can you tell us a bit about yourself for starters? Yes, yeah, so good. I am, um, obviously, I'm Philip Nunn. I am an advisor to Sporty Co. Um, I'm a UK and European crypto and blockchain influencer. Uh, I have a very large online following and I work with lots of uh, ICOs, institutions. I'm also working with several uh, hedge funds and blockchain uh, private banks that have launched. So, yeah, that's really me. As a prominent crypto insider, can you give us some insights what the future holds for blockchain and crypto? I think this year has been really, really interesting so far. And obviously we had all of the hoo-ha and absolute chaos and astonishment at Bitcoin almost hitting $20,000 a coin back in December. And I think everybody thought the gold rush was here and, you know, everything's going crazy and it's here to stay and the banks are going to collapse and crypto is this and crypto is that and crypto is the other and, and obviously what was uh, discovered at that point was a lot of the money coming into the market was people just buying on hype and it just got a bit silly and I think sort of the whole industry got ahead of itself. And I think that's the case with quite a lot of aspects of the industry as we sit today. The reason I say that is you know we have under a 500 billion dollar market cap currently as we sit and, you know, that's minuscule. If you actually look at the whole, even of the financial markets of the world, um, how much money is in circulation, it's over $200 trillion. So, which is really sort of, sort of perspective in one sense in the, as the, you know, it's a very small industry, but actually we've taken in 500, almost $500 billion as a market cap for this thing. And just imagine a world where, crypto takes 5% of those other assets. If you talk about gold and stocks and shares and bonds and things like that, if, if cryptocurrency and the movement takes those sorts of levels of uh, growth, then we, it's just going to be, uh, the hockey stick will be incredible. But as with anything, a new industry, this will happen with gold. This happened with the move from gold to paper money. The most recent um, similarity we've seen was the dot com where it was impossible to lose money in tech companies. And then actually the whole thing came collapsing down around everybody's ears um, in spectacular fashion, which was sort of a shock to the system at that time. But actually what was born of that and the main thing that happened off the back of that was the internet and the advent of the commercial internet of information. And this has been, the, for me, the biggest single revolution that happened to the world. The fact that we can exchange data with each other online. It makes the world a lot smaller. We can communicate. It's, it's globalized everything. Now, I think if you look at the, the, the sort of three things that have changed the world profoundly and are going to change the world. So the internet was the first sort of globalization in terms of making the world one place <clears throat> whereby we could all exchange values, ideas, and, in, and um, information with each other. But obviously that's very, um, different to what the blockchain movement is. The second was the advent of the smartphone, which has just been incredible and, and um, which has really spawned like the social movement. So things like Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, which have just become enormously valuable businesses because everything's all about data and, and how people behave and how people uh, live their lives, which is magnificent. And then the final thing that's going to happen now is we're going to move very, very quickly into this internet of value where what the blockchain does, as opposed to everything being centralized in one place, it creates this secure way for people to be um, able to send money to each other without an intermediary or a middleman in the, in the way. So I could send money to a chap in China now via something like Litecoin. I could send him $10,000 or the equivalent of in Litecoin and he would have that in the next 10 minutes. And there'd be minimal transaction fee, nothing messing around, nothing else. So we could create that business without anything in the middle, which is just 
so, so powerful and this is going to have a real profound effect on the world and it's going to change the way that the whole world works. So this is like the internet of value. And where the, where the real profound thing comes here, I don't think particularly it's going to impact governments initially. You know, governments will be governments and I think uh, currencies will still be currencies. I think fiat currency will diminish in terms of its value, in terms of how much we use a fiat currency. I believe it's at 70 trillion dollars now. I think it could potentially reduce to 30 trillion or 40 trillion dollars. And I think replacing that will be people transacting value with different cryptocurrencies. Obviously, Bitcoin is kind of the big daddy and that's the one that um, is kind of the forerunner. But actually, I think Bitcoin is probably going to be more of a store of value. So there's going to be different currencies that people use when they go to restaurants or when they send international payments or when they're online and buying things from things like Amazon. And you'll see in the news that's just happening this week, obviously, that Facebook have come out and said that they're now building a full blockchain strategy. And I think they were anyway. My feeling is this is sort of a PR piece based on the fact that Zuckerberg's had a load of trouble of late. So they brought the guy from Coinbase in. I mean, just imagine Facebook coin and the power of that. I mean, because I could see a future for Facebook that does not look very good at the moment. And I think Mark Zuckerberg and his team have latched onto this. So where do I see the market going now? I mean, I, a lot of my work is with... Um, sort of institutions and banks and people in in more of the the traditional world in the corporate world and where i see it going this year is i think that a lot of um, banks by the end of 2018 will be rolling out and implementing blockchain strategies and via third parties or via themselves they will be investing in this technology and not only for the benefit of their own futures. I know a lot of people have done deals with people like Ripple already and a few of the other uh, altcoins out there. But I think what you'll start to see is that much like 10, 15 years ago when China was the new big thing to invest in and pension funds and ETFs sprung up and you know emerging market funds where 5% of people's portfolios were held in these things, that will become crypto. Um, because you, these guys cannot ignore the fact that thousands and thousands of percent of returns have been gained from these these wonderful new companies. And obviously with it comes risk, but I think they will have some, some exposure to it. So for me, very much the future. Now, I predicted on Sky News um, a couple of weeks ago that cryptocurrency <clears throat> um, has the potential to have a $2 trillion market cap by the end of this year. Um, and I think that it will be much of a diversification away from simply just financial services, which is magnificent um, and plays right into what Sportico have achieved and what they're trying to do because these guys have, uh, have we, are us guys, you know, I'm, I'm with the team, we have a platform, it works, it's in beta phase, we're listed on exchanges, there's liquidity there, there are big partnerships in place and as the industry grows and more in interesting capital comes into the market, they're going to be looking for the companies that aren't just an ICO. They're going to be looking for guys that have got, you know, a year track record in crypto and a successful year with some profit on the balance sheet is a real long time and that makes you an interesting proposition. So I predict that the next 12 months will be diversification over, over many, many different uh, industries, which is already happening. I think what you'll also start to see are medium cap companies entering the market. So companies that are listed on main market exchanges who aren't able to go out and raise capital in the traditional sense anymore because they're not able to turn to the banks. Um, the VC money is very stifling and strangling. So they'll be looking for ways to leverage their brands via this decentralized, tokenized way of working. That's definitely going to happen this year. So, yeah, and, and as I said, finally, the, the bigger institutions and players will enter the market. Goldman Sachs have just come out and suggested they're going to come into the market very, very soon. So, a really exciting year ahead. Anyone who's sort of looking to get into crypto, it's a very unregulated, risky, dangerous industry, but it's exciting. So, just put in a little tiny bit that you speculatively can afford to lose. Don't do anything silly. And just the key is learn about it. Philip, your background is finance. Do you see crypto primarily as a financial product 
or do you think all industry can leverage the blockchain for a competitive advantage? So on the first question, do I see crypto as primarily a financial product? Um, absolutely not. So I think with cryptocurrency, obviously the biggest disruption area that we've seen so far was with currency in terms of Bitcoin becoming a challenger currency to the old establishment and this centralized way of working. And I think post the financial crisis, people got to a point where they'd had enough. And this movement was born out of that. And I believe the guys that founded Bitcoin very much were waiting for that moment. So where we are today is obviously Bitcoin now has and the, and the cryptocurrency industry has a substantial market cap. But actually, in terms of the size of the financial services industry, it's very small. So it's going to continue to grow and continue to strengthen. Now, what's become absolutely apparent is as as blockchain technology, obviously the underpinning technology we all talk about for Bitcoin, as this has developed, what we're absolutely seeing now is this is transferring across every industry because in terms of um, security, in terms of the uh, you know uh, fraudulent activity in terms of tracking supply chains in terms of grassroots sports stars in terms of every single industry in the world is going to be moving towards this way of working and if you look at the big boys outside of financial services a lot of the big law firms people like kpmg um, people big supply chain companies uh, pharmaceutical companies this is going to impact every single industry and have a massively profound effect. And it is a better, more secure, more cost effective way of working. And the great thing about the blockchain and why it has a profound effect is the, the flip side of it also is it absolutely empowers people who don't have the access to a bank account or are classes unbanked or actually don't have any kind of freedom of movement with their money um, so you know these industries are all going to be effective but actually blockchain for good is even more profound because it's going to give people a chance people where there's bad um, scenarios for land ownership where potentially the land ownership is very ambiguous and vague this will now be done on smart contracts and will be completely different I know certain governments are already issuing passports on the blockchain so this thing's here to stay it's massively profound and sports is such a huge industry and actually such an unfair industry in so many ways because a lot of the money is at the top it doesn't trickle down very well and that's from the sports clubs to the the leagues and the divisions right through to the sports stars so to actually give a, a, a fair and more equal way for people to benefit from their own careers that can only be really powerful what part of the Sportico project was the main reason for you to join the team and support it? Okay, so the main reason I joined the Sportico project, well, the main reason was Marco. I met Marco um, a couple of times before I joined Sportico. And this guy is just incredible. He's a, he's a very, very talented guy. And you actually don't really see that many guys like him. So guys who've got a what you see in the crypto and blockchain space is some absolute geniuses, you know, really intelligent, high level guys, deep tech guys. You know, these guys can program like you wouldn't believe. But actually what Marco brings to blockchain and Sportico is he has that knowledge and he's, 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 he has a tech knowledge and background, but he's, he's a great mover and operator as well. So he gets things done. So Marco creates a, a buzz around the product. And, you know, I, I always say to him that he's like water. Marco can get anywhere and he can get into some of the best sports stars in the world. He can open doors like, you know, the, the football clubs and Formula One teams and, you know, whatever you want. And also he's such a nice guy and I think their project's brilliant. And all the guys I've met that support Sportico are fantastic. So that's the first thing. I never work with a blockchain project that I don't believe in. And I don't like, like and or think the team can drive the thing forward and that's the first thing and the second thing is for me I think there is a huge gap in the market and I, all I'd seen it from the side the side was when I saw Marco and the first few times and he presented Sportico to me the main thing was was that this was going to disrupt sports so this was going to take the grip away from sports agents and it was going to remove power from those guys and actually 
this was going to give power back to sports stars who weren't necessarily funded. We have things like the National Lottery funding here, but it's wholly unfair. So you can be an Olympic athlete and go to Olympics and get a gold medal. And then in the next four years, you can still be top of your game. But if that funding gets pulled, you have absolutely no chance of um, uh, being at the next Olympics because your funding is pulled. And you may even be a commercially viable athlete. So there's so many bits of the industry that are unfair. But the big grabber for me where I really thought, hang on, this is really, really special, is that when we've discussed this product with sports agents and people in the industry that are actually involved and have sports stars on their books, they don't see this as competition. They see this as an enabler. And that's really fascinating. So the point being is they, they have thousands of very talented sports stars come through their door every day. Some of the guys have like Usain Bolt on the books and people like this. However, they've kind of got a one size fits all approach per agent. So, you know, if they're if they're a golf agent and that's their specialism, then why would they take on a footballer or a cricketer or whatever it may be? So there's so many um, benefits in the traditional sense as well. So there's going to be a lot of work done with Sportico whereby we're going to be working with the best people in sports and the best people at the top of the tree in sports to enable more sports stars to follow their career and follow their dreams and benefit from a fairer career as well. To earn more money, to have more control, to work with a team that can actually give them a competitive edge in, in what they're doing. And it, it's just a win-win for everybody. So that's why I really support the team. Thank you, Philip. And a lot of success with your future endeavors. I'd just like to say, yeah, big thank you for having me. And um, I'm very proud to be a part of the Sportico family. It's a fantastic project and it's blockchain for good. And what, what surprised me most about Sportico was how the non-blockchain and crypto community have really embraced Sportico, like sports agents and people surrounding the sports industry really love the product because it solves a, a, a real world problem for those guys. I think Marco is an incredibly talented guy and I just think that Sportico is going to go from strength to threat strength. So I'm really proud to be involved and I, I can't wait to work with the guys more and, and get more in depth and, and dive deeper into the project as the year progresses. I think it's going to be an excellent year. So thank you. Joining us next is Diego Berchtold, who works and lives at the crossroads of crypto and sports. He's the founder of Cryptocurrency Consulting, LTD, a Switzerland-based consultancy, and also a professional football player at FC Lausanne Sport, playing in the Swiss Super League, the top-tier football league in Switzerland. So, hello together. My name is Diego Berchtold. I'm from uh, Switzerland, and uh, I'm 21 years old. I came to blockchain like uh, one and a half year ago, starting to invest into cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. And the first thing that I really thought was, what is the power behind those cryptocurrencies? So what does it mean that something has that power that can take like a profit from uh, a thousand percent in one year? What's behind this hype? And so I went a little bit deeper in it, and that's the moment where actually I uh, went into the blockchain area and went into the blockchain business. So like one year ago, I started to do some consulting uh, business, to start my consulting business in the blockchain, in the cryptocurrency area. I started to work with, uh, with private investors, with also the first uh, agencies, with the first... Uh, I started doing the first corporations. Right now, I'm doing the consulting for uh, Swissborg, which is actually the biggest Swiss uh, ICO of the year. They just uh, had their ICO back in January with uh, 50 millions collected at the end. So that's that's the kind what I'm doing actually in the blockchain. The other side, I can talk about myself is the, the, the sports area. That means the, the football. I'm playing since I'm like uh, six years old. I started playing at a local team as uh, anybody starts at all. And for this year, this was my first uh, year as a professional footballer in the highest league of uh, Switzerland. 
So I'm pretty, pretty, pretty uh, happy about that because it took me like uh, 15 years to become a professional soccer player. And today I just, I would, I would like to talk about the, those both sides because at one side, I can talk about the uh, opportunities of blockchain, of cryptocurrency, what comes with it. And at the, and at the other hand, I see the, the perspective of a football player when it comes to sport. You mentioned African players in your team. Can you maybe explain the path to playing in Europe? Okay. So it's, it's kind of difficult to say because there is not just one way to go. You got like a hundred possible ways to come into a professional soccer or football. But in Africa, it's, it's many times it's like you're a good player, you're a young player, and there is an agent who finds you and he brings you the opportunities. And at the end, the business in the moment isn't that equal for every, everybody. Because sometimes uh, you got many players who, who are high quality players, but they don't have the reasons, they don't have the connections to get their feet into the professional, into Europe, to, to have the connections to the players agencies, to the, to the, to the business at the end. And I think that's, that's a big, big, big fortune of blockchain, because at the end with the blockchain technology we got, we can... Uh, we don't need a middlesman like an agent. We don't need somebody who brings a young player who don't have the reasons by himself, bring the money, bring the opportunities, because with the blockchain technology, he could or he can create the opportunity by himself. Since you're an athlete and crypto consultant, can you give us a unique perspective on sports and blockchain as you can cover, of course, both sides? So. When I think about blockchain in sports, and when I saw the first time the Sportico investment platform, I, I was really like, wow, this, this is it, or this could be the, one of the, the biggest opportunities for sports. I really started realizing that blockchain and sport will come together one day. We saw the digitalization the last five to 10 years ago, and like, like everything, the sports business also went digital. And at the end, I think the next digital step is blockchain. And so if I think about the digitalization of the sports industry, blockchain has to come because it will be much easier. It will be much, it, it will cost uh, much less. If I think, if I think I did it all as a, as a businessman, I think you can take many, many steps out of it. Because in sports business, you got like, like in the financial area, you got always a middleman. And with blockchain, you empower the people to don't have this middleman between two individuals. And in my opinion, blockchain will not only take over in, in football, in the football industry, I think blockchain will digitalize the whole sports industry in five to 10 years, in my opinion. Can blockchain bring more equality into sports? I think Sportico is at one, on the, on the investor sides, they bring them the opportunity to invest into the sports business. What, that wasn't really, a, literally that wasn't there before Sportico. At the other side, you got the young athletes as me, uh, if they need a financial help or if they need like uh, s s capital to start, if I, if I think about sports, it isn't, it isn't like uh, just football. I'm coming from the football business. It's, it's literally a, a little bit different. But if I think about uh, people that, uh, that are doing s ski, ra sky race, ski race, at the for an example, it's, it's like much, you got a much more financial help to get into the professional area than in football, for an example. And for guys like this, for guys like uh, my friend Nikki, who I know personally, the Sportico platform is a, is a very, very well opportunity to get these financial helps together. And for investors, you can invest into a young sportsman and get something back if he becomes successful.
Do you see investing in athletes a good investment opportunity? I think yes, because investing into someone, we always say you don't invest into a project, you invest into people. So in sports, it's like the same. You invest into people because you believe in them, because you believe they can be successful. And I think if I take a look at investing in people, it's always the same. It doesn't matter if it's in a sportsman or in a businessman. You invest your money into the people and not into projects. So I'm absolutely fine with uh, that kind of uh, investment. And we also have some questions from our viewers. You are seeing increased interest in blockchain among athletes uh, like your own team members? It's, it's more like they, they are just, uh, they don't interest much into blockchain. They are much, they, they are like chasing the hype a little bit. So it's like somebody made money with Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies and from one day to another, everyone wants to know about Bitcoin, about, about cryptocurrency. But the problem is mostly they don't go a step deeper in it. They don't really understand how this, uh, how blockchain works, how this whole industry works or this, uh, what, 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 is, what really is it at the end? I think like the people or the, also the footballers, they are interested into Bitcoin, into Ethereum, but they don't have really the knowledge about it at the moment. And I think that's, that's a great opportunity for me too, to show them what is really behind the hype. Because I think from, from my view, the, the, the philosophy behind Bitcoin is, is much more valuable than the hype we've seen uh, the last year until uh, December. And what is behind all the hype? <laughs> I, think, I think behind the hype, I see like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies from two, two sides. Because Bitcoin, in my opinion, is a, is a global uh, test, you can say. It's the first time you got a digital money without banks. So it's a project, in my opinion. And de decentralized applications such as uh, Ethereum or Ethereum-based applications, we don't really can uh, put both together because Bitcoin is a global project and Bitcoin can fail, but it don't has to fail. But I think what, what really will stay is the blockchain. So that means that our decentralized applications that are blockchain solutions. And at the end, the thing that has to come in the next years are at one side, definitely people who create something about this, about this technology behind the hype, behind Bitcoin. And at the other side, we have to create acceptance points. So that means somewhere where this technology really can be used. Diego, thank you for being with us today and all the best in the finish of the football season. Yeah, we got like three, three more games to go. Thanks to you. Have a nice day. And now back to our studio and uh, I have two guests right now. One is Crypto Robbie, which was our first guest and joining us also Marco, which is CEO of Sportico. And first, we're going to be talking about your initiative. Yeah? Yes. Um, it's thank called you for... Right Return, Return on Society. Yeah. Return on Society. Good. And it's an initiative uh, which kind of uh, caught me, it came to me. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Why? Because I see in this blockchain sphere a lot of projects which are just focusing on making money, making the rich people richer, uh -huh. uh, just, just uh, really focusing on this money part of blockchain. But blockchain is much more. It goes far beyond of this money, money, money application. Um, and that's how I found we need something which is a, gives something back to society. We need blockchain use cases with an added value to society. 
And I came from the, I worked for a humanitarian organization many years ago. I come from this charity thing. And even in research, I worked in research, we tried to make projects, uh, research projects, we, which help people, which really matter to people. That was a big focus. So it's sometimes in, you, use, you lose yourself doing something completely technology focused. You have not this broad view. And what I try, and that's why people invite me to conferences, and you mentioned in the beginning mm -hmm. that I'm at many conferences, which yes, I am. And I tell these blockchain people and startups, why are we doing this? Why are we sitting here and, and, and working on a project? And it is to give an added value to society, finally. That's my opinion, to bring something to the society, make society better, make people's lives better. And I call this hashtag mm -hmm. return on society because it's, it's, it's borrowed from return on investment, which mm -hmm. is necessary. We need return on investment. And we need also to make profit, profitable projects. But it's also very important to have a return on society, to not uh, lose this focus. And um, with projects, it's also the case that sometimes um, we, 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 we forget this pure idea. Yeah? The intention of yes. the beginning, yes. the purpose. Very much. Mm -hmm. I remind this. That, that's, that's my biggest, biggest focus. Mm -hmm. And yeah, return on society. It's, it's even conferences have been uh -huh. called uh, industry applica blockchain applications with a return on society. So they use it and it's for free. It's for free. The so open source. Everybody can use return on society. Good. So this whole movement is your way of thinking it or you feel it as it returns back on society. It exactly. gives back. It, it, we shall do things mm -hmm. which have an added value to society. Mm -hmm. It shall not only uh, be focused on money making, profit yeah. making. Okay. Of course, startups, every startup needs to make uh, profit. It must, in the long run, they must be profitable. But, but as I remember important. on the, uh, our first talk today, yes. you said we, we are actually combining or making hope or let's say yeah. that's yes. hope we're actually uh, boosting here. Of course. I mean, hope and we hope for a better future, but mm -hmm. we can also shape the future. We there are here go. to shape the future and we can give hope to people, to other people by the means of technology in this case blockchain technology and we also can use it for sports mm -hmm. supporting sports with this technology that's where I see it and that's why I think also Sportico has that's why I'm on board with Sportico and Mark, <laughs> Mark was so nice to invite me to to this uh, to this uh, project because it has a clear return on society it ha it gives an added value to society it helps young athletes to boost the mm. careers and and you said it also you mentioned it already and we heard the talks from Philip Nan and, mm -hmm. and all the other speakers uh, even Kevin uh, focused on that it is important to support young athletes and it's a new way to support them it's a it's surprise a movement, yes isn't it? <laughs> yes yes what would you say Marco how do you see Sportigo Wh where is the ship going? In yeah, which absolutely. Direction? I completely agree what, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, what Robbie said. So, uh, the goal of Sportico is to help young athletes, you know, on the most crucial uh, point of their career, where it's when it's very difficult to find enough money to support and uh, to to cover all the costs of travel mm -hmm. expenses, coaches, and all other stuff that uh, every young athlete need in order to become a superstar. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Sportico platform is a great help for them. It's maybe the only option that some of them will have in the future to uh, have the opportunity to become future superstars. So, uh, because we are solving such a big problem in the sport industry, that's why we are also able to attract so many big superstars to support Sportico, to to become our ambassadors and yeah in the future of course i i can promise that uh, many more superstars superstars will join sportico mm -hmm. you know to let people know about uh, i think that's also for the younger crowd it's important isn't yeah, it? yeah 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 to, to have these idols that to, they can follow i hope mm -hmm. give hope to yeah. them yeah but you know what all of them uh, were facing the same problem mm -hmm. when they were young Mm -hmm. Somehow they were lucky, you know, mm -hmm. that they found uh, someone 
who supported them and uh, they, they become a superstar. Hmm. And they understand this problem and, and of course they would like to help other young athletes to, to become successful. Hmm. So yeah, I'm very happy that uh, of course it's very tough because at Sportico we are building a completely new industry. Hmm. Because on one hand we are helping young athletes, clubs and teams to raise funds. On the other hand, we are allowing fans and small investors to invest into sport, which was impossible till now. Yes. So we need to work hard, you know, uh, talk a lot about the, the opportunity that Sportico is giving uh, to young talents. And of course, you know, hoping that people will understand uh, uh, the opportunity that they have to support young, young talents. And of course, we would like to spread this industry and make it happen. Raising a new sports tribe, actually, <laughs> in the world. Yeah? yeah, 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 of course. We are building a completely new sport community mm -hmm. that is uh, willing to help young athletes mm -hmm. in order that they will be successful. And of course, in the best uh, way, of course, also to earn some, something from their success. Why not? Mm -hmm. If they support young talent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if the, the young athlete will be successful, why not having a part of his earnings? But yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's a tough job mm. for the moment mm -hmm. because we are building a new industry. Uh, but I can, I can see uh, very positive, positive um, uh, feedbacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the Sportico has a bright future. <laughs> so yeah, we have several, several uh, new exciting uh, uh, partnerships coming. Mm -hmm. and uh, we will see what, what the future brings to Sportico. Beautiful. Um, you have any wrap-ups for today's summit? How do you feel this movement? Where is it going? Or what would you like it to be? I mean, uh, I, I also i am involved in other blockchain projects like energy, real estate. I advise, I help them to mm -hmm. build up this. With sports, first of all, you, you asked me about my, my beloved sport, it's ice hockey, which I play. So I feel I can do something for an industry, an industry, also something, a hobby, which I love to See, boost he it. already calls it industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great, right, Good. right. I mean, um, Kevin mentioned mm -hmm. it's a $600 billion industry. I mean, we could hear his speech, it's, it's, mm. it matters on one hand side, but it's mm. still a hobby too. So I can have my, my, uh, my hobby and, and support it with, with this project in a very new way, in mm -hmm. a very disruptive way, because we have not, have not seen, and Marco, you mentioned that the small investors can really directly uh, invest in, in prosperity.